The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health. The Empower Hour will provide information and support about mental health, substance use, and behavioral health. Our goal is to share inspiring stories about transforming lives, to strike down stigma, and to encourage our community to reach out and get help when needed. Mental health is part of all of our lives. It's time we talk about it. I'm Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, President and CEO of Greater Nashville Mental Health, and it's time to get empowered. Welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashua Mental Health. I'm Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, the President and CEO of Greater Nashua Mental Health and the host of the Empower Hour. Today, I'm delighted to have with me Jill O'Neill, who's the Associate Director of Adult Services. Welcome to the Empower Hour, Jill. It's so great to have you here. Thanks, it's great to be here. So you and I have known each other for a while because we've both worked uh, at the Mental Health Center for yes. some time now. So I'd love for us to just start with kind of your journey at the Mental Health Center, kind of how long you've been with us and what you're doing now. So thank you. Thanks again for being here. Um, I've been at Greater National Mental Health for um, going on 18 years. So it's been a journey. But um, it's been an incredible journey. And um, I started out as a case manager. So I was doing direct service work for adults, um, seeking recovery services from mental illness and substance misuse disorders. And I just developed a knack for it. And you know, I quickly became a senior case manager and was training and mentoring other new staff that came into the agency. And then from there, things really started to, you know, blossom and I started to develop into different roles. Um, one of the roles that I developed into was I um, took a role as the associate um, um, director of the quality improvement department. And that was really a different experience because I came from really understanding the regulations and documentation and, and um, you know, auditing and the importance of the, the record telling the story from not only delivering the services, but making sure it tells the story. Um, and from there, um, I developed into a training position. Um, I saw a unique need to really um, form, you know, comprehensive training. And then, you know, I took a role on as team coordinators and running two treatment teams and coordinating the treatment alongside the, the um, medical providers. And um, then I fell into the mental health court and I spent some time there. And, um, and then I stepped away from that and into my current role as the Associate Director of Adult Services. And so that's, that's where I stand today. So a lot of different roles. Yeah. I bet there are lots of different memories and things that stand out for you and like sure. unforgettable moments. Yeah, you know, when you're in community mental health, you say, you know, a lot of our days, you know, no matter how structured we have them, you know, things come up and we need to be able to adapt and be flexible. Um, but I was just thinking on the way in about just the stories and there's so many and, you know, they're so touching. Um, to be along alongside someone's journey is profound mm -hmm. and I find it to be a privilege to be able to, somebody to trust you and open up. And, you know, I've been there so long that I've gotten to know people and I've aged with them. Mm -hmm. You know, what an incredible, remarkable situation to be in to not only develop yourself as an adult, but also to do that alongside other individuals. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's definitely a privilege to walk alongside people. You, I'm it's glad you use that word because it's one I, I use a lot. Um, do you think that there's, Anything like that, I don't know, that stands out of just like how now you're in this role of really kind of mentoring and helping the, the whole department of the adult services. So what, what maybe has just molded you or shaped you to be able to do this role kind of in a way that puts clients first? And, you know, there's been the clients themselves have mm -hmm. taught me a lot. Um, through their own resiliency. Um, so, 
you know, insecurities that I had that I watched people tackle themselves through their own recovery gave me a lot of um, my own skills and development. But I've had the privilege of working alongside some really remarkable professionals, much like yourself. You know, I I worked with Dr. Kuftanek. He was our first founding medical director. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hafez, who was a visionary. And a lot of other individuals um, that I've worked alongside that have taught me something. So I think, you know, being open to mm. what everyone can offer you and the different experiences in, in your life. Um, Judge Leary was a big mentor for me through the mental health court. And um, so I, now I try to just take what I've learned and, and not only just apply it to programming, but also like systemic changes and public policy advocacy, which I feel is really important. So to give voice to some of the issues that we have that really need to be addressed. Well, what, what I just heard that really stood out from that was really just taking pieces from all your different experiences and like, what can I learn from here? What can I learn from here? And kind of seeing what each individual has to offer you. And then you get to bring all that together in your own unique way. Yeah. And, you know, part of the training when pe new staff come in, you know, we have a lot of young adults that come in. Um, they've just completed their undergraduate and they're trying to get experience in the field and feel where they, you know, where, where their long term career aspirations are. And, you know, I, I set the tone to say, you know, there's there's some individuals that you're going to work with that are going to be older than you. And it's important for you to share that and acknowledge that there's that that exists. But, you know, the beauty in of it is they have life experience that you can learn from. And we may have some new information and that they may not have that we can impart them. So the, the joint of the lived experience with the knowledge is really where people come together and the magic happens. So the magic happens in partnership and in collaboration. Sure does. Yeah. So you see that kind of in the staff and client coming together, but you also mentioned it kind of in staff and staff Absolutely. coming together. So did, are there any kind of experiences that really stand out for you kind of in, in seeing that collaboration bring magic to light? Yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, and, you know, just today I was talking to staff in our, in our housing huddle, we call it. I oversee uh, housing programs. And, you know, there's each of them were bringing something to me, just giving me little tidbits to think about. And sometimes it's not a monumental. Sometimes it's being open to the, the really small things. So like, hey, Jill, you know, think about this. And, you know, so I think that sometimes it's the small things mm -hmm. that add to the big things. And then there's some, you know, real like snap in the face kind of, you know, um, yeah, that made sense. You know, I remember Judge Leary one time, I was having a, a difficult time working with one of the prosecutors, which, you know, we just seemed to be disconnecting. And that prosecutor had approached me and talked to me about it. And I was trying to sort through that. And, and Judge Leary said, you know, at least that person had respect for you and came to you and talked to you about it. Mm -hmm. And that you need to respect. And that's an opportunity, Jill. And so that's something I think that is lends a lot to my career is being open to the opportunities yeah. and not just limiting yourself to somebody in a power of position, but an opportunity everywhere. And there's a lot of growth in that. You've clearly taken advantage of lots of opportunities in your 18 years from here to here to here to <laughs> Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Um, I, I think we should probably talk about housing for a little bit because I think there is some um, misunderstanding about what what is the housing program at Creator Nashua. Do you do you mind just spending like sure. a couple minutes on kind of what it is? Yeah. So if we provide um, housing subsidies, but it's more about an integrative service. So we work with our treatment providers to develop housing plans that are that are able to be executed in a way that they're sustainable. So we really have to, you know, we ha there's no, there's limited funding. So we really have to be strategic about how we help individuals, you know, access resources that exist in the community, and then really making sure that those programs for which people meet eligibility, we're steering them in the direction and creating capacity to serve more individuals. But it's not just about us rendering a subsidy. It's really about the supportive services to help that person transition out of homelessness 
into being housed or, you know, how to maintain that housing. Um, so that's something that was very important to me and was mm. different from the way that I've seen some of the, the housing programs function historically is to make sure those supportive services and housing supports are integrated and that there's long term success. So it's not that we have houses we put people into. It's more that we have funding for subsidies and then services to help people maintain that housing with the subsidy. To, to help them stay kind of in, in housing in a community setting. Correct. Yeah. So they're integrated, right. you know, into the natural settings. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Because I, I think there's a lot of misinformation sometimes, right? When when people hear housing program, they think, oh, we've, you know, got apartments somewhere or sure. something like that. And, and that's that's not traditionally, you know, what, what we've had at the right. mental health center. Um, but yet we've got this whole program now, yeah, um, our landlords are our customers. Our yeah. landlords and property managers are just as important to us in making sure that when we match, when a client is placed in, in a landlord's apartment, that they're successful and we provide support to the client, but we also provide support to the landlords as well. Um, so, you know, again, partnerships mm. are important. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a landlord could potentially benefit because unlike other tenants, that's the tenant with with our clients as tenants comes this whole team to help support and make sure the client's able to do the best they can to stay in that housing. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are times when it doesn't go as smoothly as it sounds. Um, yeah. But I, I know there's also been a lot of success with keeping some of our folks housed. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, those are some of the the impactful moments where you sit back and say, you know, I'm where I belong in my career because we've had some people that haven't had been housed in years. They've been considered what is defined as chronically homeless. And now for them to have a roof over their head and, and to see that moment is you can't even put words to it, mm. you know, and especially when there's children involved and there's families that they go from, you know, housing instability to be housed and the joy that that brings, it's it's remarkable. Mm. Yeah, I think I think sometimes two people might think, oh, the, the, the mental health center, you know, housing isn't one of our goals. It's not our mission. Yet it is. Yeah. So, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that basic needs. And so we have a fantastic therapist. But if a therapist is working with someone that's homeless, no matter what intervention they provide, it's not going to be as successful if they don't have, you know, stable housing, safe and stable housing. Mm. I re remember the first time I did the sleep out with the United Way. And so that's where they raise money for homelessness by having people potentially um, they involve in some programming and learning, but then also sleeping overnight uh, in a box, a cardboard box um, with the luxury of a sleeping bag, but not a pillow. Mm. Um, and just what it's like after sleeping one night like that to get up in the morning and think about if I had to now go to a job, if I had to now go to a meeting for my child's school, if I had to now go to court and try to present well, just how hard some of those tasks might be yeah. if you don't have the privilege of a home and a bed and a shower and sure. clean clothes. And it really is a very impactful thing. Um, yeah. And you throw in, we live in New England, right? So you throw in cold. the weather yeah. elements or even in, you know, the summer when it's really you know, it's it's hot outside. And, you know, over time, you can see that wear on an individual. And, you know, that sometimes may contribute to them not keeping their appointments, but us being flexible and understanding those barriers and meeting them where they're at and being able to serve them, which is, you know, important. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of the conversations that I've had you know, in previous episode with Dr. P and, and Sheila about whole person care. And with those conversations, we we're really talking, you know, a lot about physical health and mental health kind of together being whole person care. But, you know, really, it's also all of the social determinants of a person's life. Absolutely. Right. And housing being one of them. And, you know, another program you, you've, were, you've been mentioning is the mental health court. And um, I know Mark kind of 
is the the head lead for that program sure now, is. but you um, certainly have a lot of experience with that program, and I, I think that's another example of helping people maneuver the the legal system helps them have better mental health and better you know better ability to to manage daily life. Yeah. Better public safety. Better public safety, You know, exactly. um, absolutely, it all connects together. And, and that's the important piece is, is the individual and then the big picture and making sure we're addressing things and giving people a chance. Um, you know, we, that was, you know, eye-opening, even though we read about it and you understand the statistics behind it. When you see somebody that is in decompensated, you know, mental state that's incarcerated and you know that the regular traditional sentencing is just not going to work. This person needs treatment. And then working with those systems to, to put that together. And then when you see the outcome and the benefit, you say, yeah, this works. We need to keep doing this. Yeah. And then we need to make sure we get funded for this. And, you know, this continues to be part of our, you know, statewide mental health plan. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, some, some of those, think about impact and stories and things you never forget. Some of those moments for me are like mental health court graduations or um, the 10 year anniversary when we had that for mental health court and just some of the stories and things that were shared about yeah. the, the impact that it had on people's life and really changing the trajectory of, of life for a lot of and the people. And their families. A and their families, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's incredible, the stories. And, you know, we've had, a, you know, we experienced doing our job, too, with the, the successes and the challenges in between and not giving up. Um, and then, sadly, sometime the loss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, at the time that I was in the mental health court, that was really the, the beginning kind of in flame of the opiate epidemic. And we were, I was going into court and we were losing people. Every time I would go in court for the court reviews, it was another, another soul, another life lost. And, you know, that, that was, that was really challenging. Um, and the only, you know, um, way to get through that was being there to support the families left behind. Um, yeah, that, those were, those were some tough times, but we had so many more successes, um, that it just, it was so successful and it remains successful and it continues to evolve. And it's, it's never one person. It's always, it's always people that mm -hmm. are involved in this process. And so our partnership with the police department, um, the local police departments is very strong. And there's a lot of understanding and appreciation about mental health and, and, you know, treatment and it works. And so, you know, our partnerships are strong, and I, I really thank those individuals that had an open mind about it and didn't shut the door on it and really gave um, an open context to just look at it and see, is this effective? And once they saw that, it, we were starting to continue to get a flurry of referrals. Yeah, and, and you've, you've done a lot of advocacy in that space, too, um, for I think New Hampshire and even the world, if you will, <laughs> uh, going to DC um, about it, and and we, you know we appreciate that, and I know it, it is one of the things the state's looking at right now is a is a state mental health court kind of part of what we should be heading toward, kind of in the same way we've done with drug court, and you know I, I sincerely appreciate all your experience in that space and also your advocacy because um, I think you do bring a lot of of those stories of success with you um, yeah. that you can share to say, you know, this does have an impact and it is worth it because it does work. And the data. <laughs> and the data. Oh, and the data. Yes. And the, and the data. the cost savings. <laughs> so, you know, really rounding it to tell the story and, and all different angles. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I was coming in here, I was thinking about what kind of sparked my journey into be having a voice and, you know, really overcoming, you know, it is a, it's a scary thing to go and testify in front of legislation, legislators and, um, and not having experience. And I, I remember the first time I took a chance and just did this and um, I was waiting for the bill to come forward. I got there early, you know, trying to get myself in a good space and I was listening some to um, some testimony, and they were it was around pleading for funding to increase the funding for um, domestic violence crisis centers. 
And there was a family from Manchester who tragically lost their daughter mm. to intimate violence. And the father went up and testified at a public hearing and he just told a profound story. And I said, that is my responsibility for the people that we serve is to give that voice and make sure that we are funding things that work. Um, oftentimes we work in a system that has imbalances. You know, people call it a broken system, but in that broken system, there are so many things that do work. Yeah. And so it's important to keep advocating at a, at a public policy level for the things that work and keep those funding mechanisms in place. And um, I don't think I would have continued on in my journey if I had not seen that family. And I just said, they must be so brave and to, an, you know, what an enormous tragedy to hurdle through and, and to contribute in a positive way. I said, Jill, you, you've got to, you've got to, you know, challenge yourself and, and mm. do this. And so it began at that level for me. Oh, um, what, what a great story about how your, how your spark for advocacy kind of came, yeah. came to be. Because I do think we have, we have a role. You know, certainly those with lived experience, their voice and their stories are their stories to tell and are important. And they can't always tell them. Um, and sometimes as providers, we can tell them from a different perspective because um, we often remember how broken or hurt the person was when they were coming to us. And we too can see their transformation. And so we can tell the same story, but from a different perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. I think all of those voices are important and they contribute to the evolution that we, we need to continue to, to go towards. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what most excites you about like when you think about where mental health is, is headed or where Greater Nashua is headed? What, what, what gets you excited? What's keeping your flame lit? Oh, so, you know, I love to learn. And so, you know, the field is constantly coming with new information and new treatments and new medications. So there's no shortage of, of learning and, and an evolution there. But, you know, I think the um, peer support, mm. I think that lived experience, you know, it doesn't, you know, people being able to relate to people on a level that maybe providers cannot do is you just see that that has such a significant place in treatment. Um, trauma-informed care. I think the recognition of the impact on trauma in the developing brain and the vulnerabilities, because again, it's understanding what's at the root, right? Mm -hmm. So we treat this sometimes and respond to the signals, but sometimes if we're not getting to the root of the true issue, then we're really not solving the problem. Right. And I do believe that trauma has a significant impact. And I saw that in the mental health court and Mark, you know, the current liaison extraordinaire, um, you know, the prevalence of individuals that have experienced trauma in their life is substantial. Absolutely. So I think that's integration, integrative care, that whole health, the connection between, you know, physical health and mental health, there's a big interlay there. And mm -hmm. that was a great, great um, progress that the field made and neuro, neuroscience and neurobiology and really understanding that you know, it's not a, a moral injury. It's not someone choosing to be this way. This is a this is a legitimate condition. And I move away from mental illness because it has a negative connotation and move towards mental health condition because there are treatments and your condition can improve. Right. And so I'm trying to, you know, re- look at, you know, just language. The use of language is also very important. So yeah. I don't know there's one answer. <laughs> there's lots in of 18 them, right? years, but we are moving fast towards, you yeah. know. It's interesting that you mentioned language. Um, something just came up today around a training that's coming out um, from a psychi psychiatrist who's been pushing for a new label or new language for schizophrenia. Mm. Um, and, you know, in my mind, oh, it, this is a new thing, right, to think about this language. But he actually wrote an article like, six, seven years ago about the topic, but it didn't have a lot of traction then. But now there's a lot more understanding of the power of our words and the importance of using language and allowing people to choose how they want to be seen. Like, do they want to be talked about as a person with bipolar or don't they? Or, you know, and so it's interesting that there's this concept that's 
gotten more traction right now. I think it's important. I yeah. do. I think there's there's still barriers to people accessing care. I think we've we've made a lot of um, progress and awareness and and destigmatizing, um, getting help, and I that's been substantial. But I still think that there's um, we need to look at diagnoses and mm -hmm. and the labels that you know people sometimes get caught up on, and you know it's important to understand what's happening and, and what you know, what the condition is, but it's equally as more important to focus on the symptoms and treatments that are, you know, effective for that person that you're working with. Yeah, one of the interns and I just earlier today were having a conversation about the pros and cons of overdiagnosing, right? Like like you said, sometimes it gives a label so you, you know better how to treat. But I've treated and worked with many people over the years who've come in and said things like, well, I'm so sick, you know, I have this, 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 and this. And it's sort of like, oh, you know, did we do a disservice by saying you had four diagnoses rather than saying, oh, you know, all of this maybe stems from the trauma you experienced. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's interesting kind of to think about, um, you know, how it, how are we, how are we doing good by people by saying this is an illness and how are we not you know right right yeah it, we have this um this exercise we use in this evidence-based practice illness management recovery and it's a curriculum and it, it really we're we're not the experts we're just giving information and the individuals are their own experts absolutely and so this curriculum covers different aspects of how do you recover from a mental health condition what are the things topic areas you should be teaching educating and and helping someone learn skills and strategies and there's this flower exercise that starts off in the beginning in terms of identifying who you are. And so the center of the flower is really around your principles and values and beliefs. And then the petals are what kind of roles you play in life. And it's, you know, it was mind blowing to me to see how many people identified those first petals as being somebody that is diagnosed with a uh, mental illness. You know, I, I am schizophrenic, which is not the terminology we use, but how they're identifying themselves. Yeah. And then it's helping them come along and, you know, well, you're a son, you're a brother, you know, you, you're an artist, you know, and, but to them, that's what they identify first. So, you know, through just language and mm -hmm. restructuring the conversation, I think is, you know, the next step for mental health to advance towards amongst other areas that are still developing. Right. When I think about empowering people, right, that they are, they're more than a diagnosis and yeah. a diagnosis is not doomsday, right? There is treatment. There are supports. Um, there is an ability to be empowered and share your story and find a voice. Absolutely. But, you know, sometimes people with stigma or this kind of suffer in silence and don't, don't take advantage of all there is. And it's hard, you know, mental illness, a lot of the times, you know, part of the symptoms is, you know, especially with depression is the negative view, right? Low se sense of self-worth, um, you know, believing you're a burden on others. And then, you know, to do identify your place and your identity as men mental health, mental illness. Um, and for those battling co-occurring substance misuse, there's a lot of shame. Yeah, There's a lot of shame. And oftentimes, though, many people will come in and all they want to do is be heard. Right. They may come in and just need, you know, several sessions of just being able to just, you know, share what they want to share. And there's an important place to just allow that to happen so they feel heard. Yeah. And that's part of just starting the connection of building a rapport with the individual. Yeah, and I, I'd go so far as to say, and they deserve it, you know, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. They want it. They want to be seen and heard, but they deserve to be seen and heard. Every person deserves yeah. to be seen and heard. They're desperate for it. Yeah, because many people haven't allowed them to, or it's been quieted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. So what? what else... What else should we talk about? What, what What's another okay. story you can so, tell me? <laughs> there's a lot of stories. Um, I, I truly do believe that um, in our staff. And I, mm. and, I, and I pause for a second and say that because 
our workforce right now, especially with COVID and, you know, helping put their others first and their service to the community and their right. service to others. You know, I would be remiss if I did not recognize our staff. Mm -hmm. um, many also going to graduate school and managing internships or managing families or second jobs. The incredible sense of community, not only within our organization, but outside of our organization. You know, I'm very proud to be from Nashua um, because of this sense of community, but our staff are extraordinary people in terms of the givers that they give. And they often, you know, we talk about self-care and boundaries and balance and um, but the, their their commitment to serve is extraordinary. Mm. And I just have so much respect for someone that comes in. We just had um, staff that volunteered their time this weekend to yes. collect hygiene pro products to be able to give to some of our clients that, you know, are are in need. And so, you know, these are these are young adults who are managing multiple things, including graduate work and working full time and then they're choosing to go out on the weekend to continue to give back. And you know, that makes me proud mm. and that's what motivates me is their commitment. And you know, I do see our community partners. I see our police and our f firemen and women and you know, there's a sense of rallying around. We just had a, a homeless um, you know, um, meeting on Monday with our stakeholders and they're wanting to come to the table. And they're wanting to be part of the solution. And I think that's pretty profound. Mm. I think that sense of community. And I remember when I was getting ready to move on from the mental health court into my current position, I went to a graduation, a mental health court graduation. And I, I remember I walk, uh, Judge Leary walked out and he said, the first graduate today is Jill O'Neill. And so I had my own graduation from mental health court. <laughs> And it was fantastic, and um, I got a great, you know, portrait, a painting of downtown Nashua, mm. and that was, um, you know, a gift to me in saying, Jill, um, you are part of this community. It's so important to you, and it truly is, And but it's not just to me. We have so many others that are committing their time, and, you know, it's that old, you know, the old adage of, you know, um, Mr. Rogers and his mother's life lesson, which is in, you know, tragedy, look for the helpers. Right. And I see that every day. So I may go home and turn on the news and be completely overwhelmed with what's happening in this world. And then not only do I look to my family and what wonderful people they are to support me and keeping me strong so I can continue to do my good work, but I look, I come to work and I work with extraordinary people at the office mm. and in our community so there's a lot to be proud of to be from Nashua. You yeah. know, we're not, we're not perfect. We still have areas we need to improve upon, but we definitely have a very invested and engaged community. Yeah, I, I'm so glad I just sort of threw it to you to say, hey, what should we talk about next? Because, oh, so perfect. Just perfect. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that it, the examples of just how our staff come with ideas. I mean, that that whole idea for the hygiene drive came from a staff person saying, hey, this is a need I noticed. How can we fill it? Absolutely. And then we partnered with a United Way, a community partner who was already doing drives and then volunteered and to make it just happen to, to you know, find the helpers in the tragedy. Yeah. Um, the power in people, right? Yeah, exactly. And e even at a state, a state level, you know, I one of my mentors recently has been um, our deputy adjutant to the National Guard, Warren Perry. When I first started getting into like public hearings and trying to be that voice of things that are working and promote support for it and funding, um, you know, you get into an area where I'm just not familiar. And, you know, he gives me a lot of guidance. Um, and he also works with me on justice involved veterans and supporting our veterans behavioral health track. And there's just this collective whole in New Hampshire of like a grassroots level, which is like, let's just come together and let's just get it done. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's something pretty incredible. With our small state, we have the ability to do that. And so whether it's the state, our community, or in our agency, it's it's exist. Yeah. But you just have to be open to it. And yeah. that's something I've been talking a lot about this week with people coming in the door, which is... You know, a lot of people come in and their treatment expectations 
you know, our, sometimes our role as providers is to, to kind of help formulate that and make sure there's clarity in that so that people are not we're not in two different directions about what we're looking to work on and accomplish. And obviously, sometimes change can be very slow. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, it's very important that, you know, there's this appreciation for what's working and having an open mind. Yeah. Just have an open mind. Just show up to your appointment, hear what someone else has to say, and just consider it. Doesn't mean you need to take it. Doesn't mean you need to take the suggestions of the services. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even mean it might be today. Might be, could be ten mm-hmm. years from now. Right. Exactly. And I've seen that happen. Yeah. I've seen yeah, me too. experiences where we've had these meaningful conversations, and the person hasn't been there. And then they, you know, ten years later, they come back and they say, "I remember." And I said, "What would Jill say?" <laughs> <laughs> and I took your advice. How did it work? <laughs> right. Exactly. Hopefully well. Hopefully well. There's, there's two things in what you've just been saying that I really want to appreciate and highlight. And one is just kind of what feels like a superpower of yours to just be open and ready to hear a benefit from anybody. I just That's just so powerful. And the other thing that you said that I think is so important is that our advocacy is for what works, right? It's not like we're saying, hey, you know, just, just give us money when we'll f- go figure it out. We're saying, no, like there's this program. We've seen it have impact. We know it works. We want to give it some more people. We want to advocate for funding for what works. Absolutely. Yeah. I I love the way you said that. It's just so, I think it's just so important. Well, it's, you know, how do you use your time, right? And so people would say that a lot to me, Jill, you know, you know, you got to scale back and it's, no, I'm just conscious about how I use my time and where I put my energies to. And some people will say, well, this, this area, you're not seeing a result. And it's like, because I'm patient, mm-hmm. because I'm persistent, because I see the value in it. And sometimes that's what it takes. And that happens in treatment, too. It does. Yeah, it does. Because, I mean, it, it, you know, there's all kinds of memes and things you can find now, right? It's not doesn't look like this. It sometimes looks like this, <laughs> right? But, you know, through those ups and downs, you're still making progress. You're still learning. You're still growing. You're absolutely, you know, and we all are. Absolutely. If we're if we're open, if we're open, if we're open. Yeah, yeah. it's true. It's like talk talk about empowering, right? Like being open and and learning and um, one of the things I've always said is being being open to the idea of it's not about me being right, but it's about getting it right. Absolutely. Right. And so, how do I let go of, you know, let go of my what I what I thought coming through the door, and still being open? Okay, maybe what I thought is is still what's right, but maybe it's not. Yeah. And it's okay to be wrong. Yeah. It's okay to be wrong. I think there's this, there seems to be this kind of. Um, you know, unsaid feeling that everyone has to be right, but it's okay to be wrong too. Mm-hmm. And that just, just being open to that and right. trying. And, yeah. It's uh, part, it's part of the journey. It's part of the journey. That's how we grow. Right. Right. I mean, you, when, when you're a little kid in elementary school, you don't know how to do multiplication. If you tried, you'd get it wrong, but it doesn't mean you're never going to get it. It means it's not the right time to get it. That's and right. then as you learn and as you grow, you get it. And, and so it's the same thing with, with life. I mean, the choices we made were the best we could make for what we knew in the moment. But the more we learn, the more we can grow if we're open. If we're open. If we're open. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And, you know, I would say, too, just with like the stigma. Mm. And, and I've, I've had great pleasure of working with a lot of individuals and, you know, really high positions or have great authority, decision making, and they're just people too. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. We're all just people. And I think, you know, we have to, titles are great. You know how I, you know, feel about this in terms of titles. Titles have a meaning, but they're not everything. Mm -hmm. They don't define the person. And I think a lot of times when I see people come in for treatment, um, you know, they get caught up on that. But we're just people. You, they're the expert on them. That's and right. our job is just to help create that openness in their thinking and considering different things and different treatments. And they're the ones that are the experts in their life. Um, and that's what I mean about setting clear expectations and care and the importance of that. Because, 
you know, we don't have all the solutions, Mm -hmm. but we have a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of information and, and treatments available that can help. And it's up to them and their openness and our ability to work together and see where it goes. And if we're not seeing success, that's okay. Right. We'll recalibrate. We'll come up with a different plan. I think that can be hard for clients coming into treatment because they're used to maybe medical facility where the doctor would tell you what to do. Take this medication, do this, rest that, you know, sleep this, take these days off of work. I mean, literally telling you exactly what to do to quote unquote get better, right? Mm. But as as clinicians, as in the mental health field, even with all of our wraparound services, that's not our approach. You know, our approach is often inviting people to learn or saying, well, here's some ideas, which one of these fits best with your life? Or, you know, do you mind if I share with you a potential solution? You know, rather than just advice giving, Right. Um, and I think that can be hard for, for clients. And so it, it is a good thing to sort of set that understanding or that expectation to begin Absolutely. with. Absolutely. Well, and we live in a society right now where, you know, it's quick to with the ailment, the remedy, right? So we want a quick rea- a response. We want a quick, quick treatment. And that's just, it's not going to be long term if it's quick like that. Usually it's mm-hmm. its not just medications. It's, it's also other types of interventions, other treatments that work best that we see. Mm-hmm. That's why we're different from traditional outpatient treatment. We provide team-based services and it's medication if somebody chooses to take medications. And it's other types of services and treatment. Right. And it's about returning somebody or increasing their ability to function. And one of the programs I oversee is in um, supported employment. And that's really important because, you know, that structure, that's, you know, socialization, that's purpose, it's meaning. And so it's not just about take these this medication and, you know, this will support you in recovering from your depression. Yes, that might be a component. It might also be, you know, a linkage to other resources that you're not able to, you know, access, meeting your basic needs through a case management service. And it could be connection to a supported employment specialist to start to transition you into into work. And right. so that that's the collection of services that can work for individuals. And that's what makes us different from traditional treatment. Yeah, it's what makes us different. For sure. You know, it also like I'm struggling to figure out like the, there's a word my brain's trying to come up with, but it's it's like it's special, you know, like there's it is there's just something because it's it's also like you're walking alongside somebody in a much different way when you're talking to them about their resume or their budget or what they're eating or their exercise. Um, Absolutely. And it is the whole health. And part of the yeah. whole, addressing the whole health yeah. is having a variety of services and resources. You know, we just have it under one roof, the majority of it. Whereas I'm not saying that, you know, outside providers don't refer to these services. Our benefit in our agency is we have all those services under one roof so we can talk to each other and help advance that person along their journey um, by having close collaboration and and coming together, increasing supports when it's necessary. Yeah, and then our awesome staff, of course. And our awesome staff, <laughs> and our awesome staff's families. We thank the, our families, too, for supporting us. It takes a strong family <laughs> behind a, a, a mental health provider or administrator. It sure does. <laughs> it sure does. So time has gone so quick. It, this has been a fun conversation for me. So I'm delighted you are here. Um, I do like to say, to have people say sort of something they do personally that empowers themselves to be their best self. Because, you know, that's our, our mission is about empowering mm-hmm. people to live full and satisfying lives. You know, at the mental health center, it's through effective treatment and support. Um, but really, I think people empower themselves daily in different ways. So I I just, I love to hear different things and different ways people are doing that in their lives. I really, I like to walk and I like to hike. So being in nature and Mm. just exercising, I think there's, I promote this as a lot of benefit to that. So that rejuvenates me. Um, It's a stress reliever too. So it helps create balance for myself. Um, 
my environment and who I surround myself by with is really important. They empower me. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, my children, you know, I think I try to be open and, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, you know, and that's the beauty in this is we can all share our ideas. And, and I want people to know, too, we're human, too. Yeah, and and they're human, too. And, and every no one's perfect. We, you know, we don't practice this, um, you know, without fault. But, you know, my children and being able to get to, you know, a point where you remember being young, you know, whether you're going sledding with your children and you're having fun like that. I remember I was joking with my kids you know, uh, last winter when we went sledding and they wanted to go in and I wanted to keep sledding. And I said, you can't hang with your mom. (laughs) So, you know, I think that's bringing back that youth. Mm. um, Playing. Playing, yeah. Being with my family Mm. and um, exercise. And, you know, um, I love music too. Music is a healer for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that to me also, you know, helps me as part of my self-care. You know, if I'm having a bad day, I might turn on a tune and, you know, jam it out. <laughs> what what I love about all these different answers is there's never just one thing. Never. Right? Sometimes some people have, have a one thing priority, like this is a thing I have to have in my life. But then there's like lots of other things. And I think that's a good lesson for everybody is yeah. like it, it's not, you know, it, it's not one thing. It's not. And sometimes you may have that one thing and that one time it just doesn't work. So you so, need the others as so a backup. You, yeah, we talk in, you know, about in, in services about a toolbox of coping mm, skills exactly. and not just having one, but a variety of things that you can try, you right. know, to help yourself. And, and that applies to us as yeah, well. Everyone. No one's immune from even, you know, if anything COVID has taught us is we share in the struggle together. We sure do. We share in the struggle together and we're we're all we're all struggling in some ways and we're, we're all doing well in, you know, other ways where we're connecting um, or not connecting, but yeah. helping each other is important. Being open to learning and growing, helping each other, collaborating. It all sounds good to me. Yes. Yeah. Well, I have so appreciated spending this time with you and I'm, I'm so thankful for you joining us today and i'm thankful to those of you who have watched um, us today in the empower hour Um, thank you and i hope that you have an empowered day the preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content the opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station its staff board of directors or underwriters